Welcome to Bolter World. I'm Charlene. I'm Crispin. And it's our week in review. Bolter World is a premier channel where we discuss important issues facing Northern, Central and Eastern Europe. But before we begin, how are you, Crispin? Uh, I'm good. Uh, we have now entered summer proper here in Australia. Uh, I know that the first snows have fallen across the Baltic and mm. everything is doused in a wonderful wintry, Christmassy feel. Well, we're, here we're sweating. <laughs> we, we are hot. Uh, so I apologize if we start sweating at some point because we turn the air conditioner off to do the recording because obviously it's noisy and can be captured on the microphone. So mm. hope you appreciate that, guys, because eventually it's going to get grueling and thankfully when we do the weekend review it's all in one take but when i do the the single shots where mm. i'm doing the things there's often multiple takes i might say something silly do a rerun and by the end of it my goodness it's hot so uh so that's good but you know nice and summery uh long days outdoors i uh, had a pool party on the weekend so getting into the kind of australian feel but it is very very hot yeah it goes up to like 40 degrees celsius here mm. up to or Something even excessive yeah. even excessive yeah so i'm like once that hits i go to the shopping center and use the aircon <laughs> like i don't lie by the beach actually that's one thing you know, it's a part of australian culture people might not know but we're very sun safe here like people wear their hats and sunscreen like they understand yeah uh, comparatively yeah so we have the highest rates of skin cancer in the world i mean i don't know why that is maybe like a I giant know... hole above australia <laughs> well we are a bunch of extremely pasty Europeans stranded on an uh, island nation under the scorching sun. Uh, when you get to Europe, you, you kind of see the difference in climate mm. and understand how much uh, it is likely to cause us you know, serious skin problems. Uh, but we are also very mindful of it. You know, every single Australian remembers the time when they got so sunburned they couldn't walk. Uh, <laughs> and that's happened to everybody. Uh, we've, we've all been there. So we are much more cautious about having the sunscreen and the hats and, as Charlene says, being mindful. And we definitely see that when we have European tourists come yes. to Australia and you can pick them out immediately because they are redder than that uh, colour of, of blanket right there. It is they're yeah. just burnt like a tomato. Um, yeah. So when you come to Australia, don't think you're missing out on the sun if you cover up properly with yeah. sunscreen and everything. You will still get the tan. You will still get burned. Um, you just will still be able to function because uh, there is nothing worse than having your skin not just crackle and peel off, but but fragment and ugh. get sticky and and ugh, it, yeah. it, can, it can get really bad. Yeah, don't underestimate the sun here. It's it's incredibly. I don't know. I've I've been traveling other places in the world, and Australia's sun is just so much different. Yeah, different calibre. Yeah, definitely. Good point. Mm. But it is a wonderful place to um, come to. So as the borders begin to open up. Uh, you do think about Australia as a travel destination. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've been good. And we're coming up to Christmas. Have you got any Christmas traditions? See, in my household, oh, can I explain to people? Right. So there's been some delays. You might not see me for a while. My ceiling fell down, Crispin. That's my update. <laughs> Check your ceilings, people. Yeah, we'll see um, if we can stick a picture up. Yeah, I'll stick a picture up. You're like, what is this? <laughs> like from a horror film. Yeah, it's not it's not just a little corner. It's no. the whole thing. <laughs> the whole shebang. It just like fell. Um something about building authorities. I don't know, but is what it is. I don't have to host Christmas, thankfully, now. But do you have any Christmas traditions? Uh well it's kind of strange. So my father's side of the family are all kind of traditional Italian Catholic types, mm. larger than life personalities christmas is a huge thing all of the food all of the festivities and presents and all of the rest of it um, mother's side of the family they're all you know very stilted british types who hmm. don't like much interaction and don't really understand getting involved in too much family activities and things like that so uh, because i'm where i am now i'm closer to the mother side of the family just geographically and because there are still a lot of internal restrictions for travel uh, I probably will be prevented from uh, engaging in too much of our Christmassy activity. Mm. Uh, I quite like Christmas, but I think I would prefer it once every four years or so, <laughs> like the Olympics. Like the Olympics is like an extravaganza event. Yeah. But then because it, Christmas comes around every year and it's sort of taken over by a commercial focus, you know, like you get the 
you, you know exactly when all the stores are bringing out their Christmassy stuff. You get the Christmas carols from like mid-November onwards, and mm. mid-November. Uh, it's like oh, the beginning of November. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's beyond the pale, and uh. so. I feel like Christmas has been commodified to such a degree that it doesn't feel special. I think that would be less the case if it was rarer, if it happened only periodically. Mm. Uh, because happening each and every year means that all of the businesses can factor that in mm. as part of their preparations. But if it was once every four years, it would leave it to more experimentation. Yeah, I guess so. But then how much can you innovate Christmas? It's just meant to be family time. Well, it's meant to be, but it's it's not. Though. Like it's gotten uh, a bit over the top with, uh, this is just my view. Like mm. if you have an internal family tradition, so, you, you know, your parents and the, and the children and everything, and you manage to stick to that regardless of the broader social change, then that's excellent. But I feel like the focus on presents on uh like extravaganza mm. it has become more and more commercialized right. and now is that because it's kind of lost its like religious focus as well certainly uh part of that and i don't think people need to be heavily involved in the religious aspect to enjoy the christmas tradition mm. for example japan they're not a christian country right Everyone becomes Christian for one day, right? <laughs> because they love Christmas, and it, there is a you know they have their Christmas traditions, and they've kind of adopted mm. that. Uh, I think that there's nothing wrong with as, as long as you you know you focus on the things that you, you're grateful for in your life, that the people you're closest to, mm. uh, that you um, think about the people that may not have them might be orphans or or whatever, don't have family around, mm. uh, and you you kind of think about the broader social good, then that seems very wholesome and Christmassy. But um, when you're just bombarded with advertising and yeah. all you get is like, you know, you should spend this money for Christmas and do this and don't forget this other thing and uh, rah, 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 rah. Like it's no longer about doing good or being grateful or mm. um, remembering like the people that you may not be around forever. Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of interpersonal relationships that make Christmas what it should be. Um, instead, it becomes something consumeristic. You don't, there is much more of a fear of missing out than there is mm. um, wanting to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I definitely think, well, because my family aren't Christian and like our like family re uh, reunion is Chinese New Year. So mm -hmm. that's like where, where if I'm over overseas, like say Malaysia and it's around Christmas, we don't celebrate Christmas because everything is open. Yeah. <laughs> like it's literally a commodity. Like it's literally everything is open. It's time to shop. Uh, but then Chinese New Year hits and that is like when everything closes and it's, yeah, family traditions. And it's very, I feel like it's very ground, it, grounded, but I mean, I'm not there um a lot of the time during chinese new year i, I bet yeah it's like that but christmas for swap that around if that makes sense any sense i also think that christmas is a much better tradition as a winter tradition so yeah in, instead of summer yeah i mean um, in part some of the icons are might you know you've got santa and his sleigh and the big suit and everything like obviously that makes a lot more sense in a winter climate yeah uh, but more than that because the days are shorter, the, the temperature is colder. You have to make an effort to to come together and and uh, and really kind of celebrate this dark winter feast. If you know what I mean. Mm. So it's got this sort of a railing against the climate kind of um, uh, mentality. It's very homely and very wholesome. Whereas in Australia, where it's burning hot, uh, the best place to be is at the beach or at a pool uh, and. Or like me, you put on a winter movie and sit in the inside in the aircon. <laughs> like I'm having my moment. Okay, so Charlene, this just reminds me, has not seen <laughs> the best Christmas movie of all time. What's that? Die Hard. We have to watch Die oh, Hard. I haven't seen that. No, of course I not. No. So, uh, as part of the Pop next Pop step Pop. of uh, educating Charlene on pop culture, we will watch the best ever Christmas movie by far. Okay. Die Hard. Great. I'm just yeah. public embarrassed myself. Yes, I have not watched Die Hard. That's okay. Was... They'll, they'll, all, they'll all be cheering <laughs> you on for, for, for this great Christmas experience you're okay. about to enjoy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. But also, 
on that note, I also wanted to say um, the whole feeling of commercialization. I really feel that with Easter. <laughs> Of all the of all the holidays throughout the year, I think Easter is the worst of it because it has, chocolate has nothing to do with the actual tradition itself. Like you know, there's like strands for Christmas, you know, with um, the gift giving and all that kind of stuff. But Easter, no, nah, that, that is full on. <laughs> yeah. Well, good point. I agree. Except the egg tradition is a pagan tradition, and I will go into a greater depth around Easter uh, next year, explaining kind of the history behind the mm. eggs because it will be of relevance to this audience. Okay. Um, Not chocolate eggs, right? Like actual egg. Or is it chocolate eggs? Well, it, it's, it starts out as actual eggs. So, you know, you paint them and you do things with them. But uh, and, and they still have that tradition uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, mm. So we will discuss that at length and we'll, we'll do some uh, kind of little thing here to, to show people. Uh, but uh, so the egg tradition at Easter has a strong pagan root, and it was one of the f the few times where the Christian tradition has adopted the pagan tradition. So hmm. most of the time, you've got uh, like saints' days and and Christian traditions that co-opt pagan traditions. So the, the the local groups already have their rituals that they perform, and the Christians go, oh, okay, well we'll make that this saints' day, and you can still do some of that stuff. Um, but you'll be celebrating God instead of whatever yeah. pagan uh, spirit you, you worship. Uh, and that, you know, was a very pragmatic expansion of Christianity because it meant that they didn't, you know, dramatically alter the lifestyle of people who had their own rituals and traditions. Mm. Um, Christmas, of course, being one of them. And uh, Easter, uh, of course, being another, you know, celebrating the death and, and resurrection of Christ. Mm. But this whole egg tradition and chocolate tradition, all of that is pagan roots, and that has been adopted by the Christians world, world over. Another good example would be Halloween. Um, so uh, we will go into some of that in, in future videos as to how that plays into the day. But uh, I'll give you one little tidbit. Okay. How do you calculate Easter? So every year... Christmas is the same time, 25th of December in the um, Latin rites, and yeah. then it's different slightly in the Orthodox tradition, usually early January. How do you calculate uh, the Easter in the world? Because it, it varies year to year. Every year it's a different uh, different time. In fact, mm -hmm. it, can, it can be between early March and late April. Mm. Um is it similar to Chinese New Year? It's on a lunar calendar. <laughs> it is on a lunar calendar. That is a good start. And what do you mean? If, if it is on a lunar calendar, it's based on the moon, isn't it? Like... It is based on the moon. So it is, you're, you basically got it. It is the first uh, Sunday, mm. so Easter Sunday, the yeah. first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Okay, so the, the, the spring equinox being in the northern hemisphere mm. would be the autumn equinox down here. Uh, and the spring equinox being when there is an equal amount of day and night. Okay, so 12 hours and 12 hours. Well, then the next full moon mm -hmm. after that date will be the marker of when Easter will be. Mm. And it's the first Sunday after that, which is why you have such a huge range. Yeah. Because it's obviously on the lunar cycle after the equinox. Huh. Um, and uh, and all of that is sounds very pagan, you know. It doesn't sound like a, a particularly Christian um, tradition, and mm. that's because it isn't. So I actually really like Easter because it is a really um, a good example of a successful blend of various different faiths and traditions into one uh, kind of unifying uh, sort of experience. And the other reason I like Easter is much more pragmatic in that you get all the holidays around Easter, <laughs> but you don't have the same family responsibilities, which means that you can go traveling around the world and do things um, without the same expectation that you'll be available. Um, so at, at Christmas time, there's an expectation that you're free um, to do family stuff and do other things, whereas mm. in Easter, you can go and do other things, which is one of the reasons why we're planning our trip to the Baltic in Easter. around Easter. <laughs> yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Stay tuned. So this week you discussed how Russia is amassing troops on the border mm -hmm. of Ukraine. Yes. And now I, as just a normie, am really confused of why Russia wants more territory from Ukraine. Didn't they really get Crimea? Like, why are they suddenly 
wanting to claim that territory? What's their advantage? You did go onto the video um, about how they feel threatened by the EU as one thing. Yes. I mean, Russia oscillates terribly between fear and greed. So on the one hand, Russia feels very threatened by the expansion of NATO, Mm. uh, previous invasions of its territory, uh, and the deep sense of weakness and uh, sense of grievance that the West has taken advantage of Russia somehow during its time of weakness. Because for 50, 60 years during the the Cold War, the Soviet Union was this Mm. all-powerful state occupying much of Europe. Uh, It had done more than any other country, let's be honest, to defeat Nazi fascism Mm. and uh, at the cost of, you know, 28 million lives. So they had this sense of historical grievance that when they collapsed, instead of helping them and being there for them... Mm. They just uh, took their... (laughs) Yeah, they they lost everything. Uh, They had Yeltsin during the 90s, this crony capitalism, the whole plundering of the country, every bit of resource... Mm had all these billionaire oligarchs steal everything and go overseas, uh, and the people plundered into some terrible depths of depression and financial ruin mm. with a, a you know, viral corruption spreading across the, the landscape. So the Russians feel like they were taken advantage of. Now, do I agree with that? Yes and no. Okay, so th- th- there are two sides to that coin. On the flip side, Mm-hmm. There is also a sense that Russians are among them in their own minds are great people that have contributed enormously to literature, to music, to science, science, yeah, absolutely, technology, religion, uh, ideas, and that they are, mm. you know, a mighty empire from hundreds of years of, of great history, and that they have a right, an intrinsic right, to a sphere of influence, irrespective of what the country's that are affected by that influence personally desire. What do you mean the sphere of influence? Well, part of the markers of being a great power in the minds of many Russians is to be able to dictate on your periphery Mm. things that are of interest to you. So uh, if you are unable to, for example, prevent the Americans from making sure Taiwan is off the coast of Mm. um, China and independent, then there's an argument that maybe you're not truly a great power because a great power would be able to control its near abroad Mm. and push out any potential adversary. Mm. Uh, And then what you've got is these people in Ukraine who are native Russian speakers, so in Crimea, in Donbass, in Donetsk, uh, who are primarily kind of Slavic, Orthodox Russian speakers, and the Russian government believes that it has a right to intervene on anything that infects like those people. Right, okay? yeah. And then there is the kind of greater pan-Slavic um, identity. So if you go back to the sort of the Kosovo intervention in the late 90s with Serbia uh, and the ethnic Albanians in Kosovo, yeah. um, well, Serbia is a Slavic society. It has a language history, language tree that is similar to that of, of Russian. It uses Cyrillic script. And uh, the Serbian government has always had a close relationship to the Russian government. Now, NATO bombed the hell out of it in the late 90s Mm. and the Russian government was powerless to do anything about it. So they have this sort of sense of like, okay, if there are people that are Slavic, Orthodox, uh, culturally similar to us, Mm -hmm. then we have a right to basically influence what what affects those politics, okay? Mm. Uh, Now, what NATO has said and, and... Stoltenberg, the Secretary General in particular, is saying is that look, you have no God-given right mm. to a sphere of influence. Russia is entitled to the things that happen within Russia's borders. Yeah. Uh, and that other sovereign countries that are internationally recognised have rights to their borders. Mm. Uh, and it's up to the governments of those countries to dictate okay. what kind of international relations they yeah. want. And that includes Ukraine. Uh, that Ukraine should have a right to join NATO if that's what the Ukrainian government Mm. so decides and if it's accepted by the other member states. So why can't Russia do what China does and just increase the dependence (laughs) of, like, Russian things? You know what I mean? Like, instead of, like, being, you know, on the offensive, just kind of, like, 
sort of like influence what they do to Crimea and <laughs> well, pull actually, them into the circle of influence. Like, that would be way smarter, wouldn't it? <laughs> like, well, the, you've, you've touched on something that's a real nerve in Russia. And I, I think this is one of the things that isn't discussed enough, which is Russia is a state in decline. So at the mm. end of the Cold War, they lost a third of its territory, mm. Soviet Union, and half its population and GDP. Okay. Absolute collapse. If you look at the demographics of Russia today, the average life expectancy for a Russian male is late 50s, early 60s, way, way younger than any comparable person in anywhere else in the West, uh, that the highest rate uh, of uh, liver disease, mm-hmm. um, of drug overdoses, like all of these social ills are massive problems in Russia. You've got a dependence on oil and gas pretty much for the entirety of the economy. Uh, you've got a serious corruption problem mm-hmm. running through every layer of, of the society. Uh, you've got a massive influence of Russian mafia and therefore you know, drug production, distribution, human trafficking, weapons shipments, um, all of these things creating a, a serious cancer on Russian growth. And with the exception perhaps of the Sputnik vaccine that they released you know, fairly early on, uh, which does seem to work more or less within the context of the variants that it was designed for, uh, it, with that exception, Russia hasn't really contributed anything to science and technology uh, internationally since the end of the Cold War. Mm. Uh, and if you think of Russian literature and music and, and Tchaikovsky and Pushkin and uh, all of these great traditions, well, what, what since the end of the Cold War has Russia gifted the world in terms of its human development? Very little. That is not true for China. China in the like one and a half generations has lifted people, hundreds of millions of people out of abject poverty into the middle income stream. Uh, they have uh, gone from no brands at all to some of the dominating global brands in every field yeah. of, of uh, consumer good that you can name. Uh, and China continues to contribute immensely to the global supply chain at a, a, a massive level there you know and then in terms of their individual um, human development you know, average incomes life expectancy all of that, all of that is increasing yeah. dramatically so russia is is the inverse of that oh, there's um, nothing to keep you saying oh my god well it's what what they say there is a sense of nostalgia and, and grievance right. um, we were once great and we've contributed so much and we deserve to be recognised for our glorious uh, contributions, and but even if you expand like further into mm. Ukraine, like wouldn't it make it worse for Russia, <laughs> like because they have more to take like responsibility, <laughs> like to I'm not sure. Maybe I'm I don't know. I don't know how to run you're a not, country. No, no. You look. It's interesting. <sighs> a lot of this is about the mentality. Oh, okay. You know, if if they're taking territory and expanding. There's a sense that Russia is becoming stronger. Russia is becoming great again. Uh, that if you've got a leader who's been there a long time, might be you know beyond their their prime, uh, and yet there is a successful war that uh, expands the borders of Russia, pushes back against mm. NATO. Uh, then domestically at home, irrespective of if it makes you wealthier or not, uh, there is a sense that your country is doing something to be proud of, that, that you are a mighty country and you're able to stand up to the rest of the world, that, that you know, Germany, France, the Americans, mm-hmm. they have to take you seriously. Uh, they're not willing to face you like in battle. Uh, and so there is a there is a sense of grandeur. And that's what I mean between uh, for, for Russia in terms of swinging between fear and greed. Mm. I don't think the Russians seriously fear an invasion of their territory via Ukraine, okay? Um, I don't believe that is true. But what I do think is that uh, they fear that if if Ukraine, which is where their religion originated, you know, it was uh, Vladimir of Kiev who first brought the Kievan Rus into Orthodox Christianity and spread uh, mm. to the rest of the, of the Rus, uh, that so much of their cultural tradition is in Ukraine. If Ukraine was to become part of NATO, if Ukraine was to become part of the EU, 
the, the Russia's in, entire raison d'etre as a pan-Slavic identity disintegrates. Yeah. So I think from a Russian point of view, far more than the um, sense that, you know, Ukraine could become a military threat for Russia, mm. it w- it's that Russia as a, as a great state would be lost to history, that, that the very cultural heart beating heart uh, has has joined the Western liberal mm. bloc. Um, so there but is... as you describe, like how you know you you stated that Russia hasn't really contributed significantly since the Cold War, like hasn't already not started to lose its identity over time. Well, Russia is, yeah, it's it's very sad. I mean, like... the, the 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 Russian military aggression in Ukraine and other places is more a sign of Russian weakness than its confidence and strength. Uh, A a proud, confident Russia Mm. wouldn't feel the need to shore up its domestic validity by, uh, you know, threatening its neighbours in this way. Uh, a, A strong, confident Russia wouldn't have to assassinate political rivals or imprison, mm. uh, you know, it, it, people that have, have come back from abroad yeah. um, to because they would be confident in their institutions and their political system and their, and their power bases. It's, big, it's the sense of fragility that is causing Russia to, to lash out a bit. My fear is that Russia could get away with this, okay, uh, Ukraine is the weak link in this chain. I think NATO has demonstrated strong support for the Baltic countries and Poland. Mm-hmm. Still a challenge from a military planning point of view. Uh, it is overstretched. Uh, that territory is very flat and vulnerable. But I do think NATO would respond to an invasion of the Baltic countries. I think the Americans would be up for it. The British would be up for it. Mm. Uh, they would drag the, the Germans uh, kicking and screaming to the table as well. Uh, and, and so the Baltic countries, I think, do properly benefit from NATO membership. But Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Yeah, It has a very large ethnic Russian-speaking minority uh, which is the majority in the east of the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, there is a great reluctance, uh, particularly among the Germans and the French, to get involved in anything to do with Ukraine. And the argument has been made, and I'm sympathetic to it, that the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which Germany greenlit, uh, creates a pipeline across the Baltic Sea, yeah. gets around the pipelines that go through Ukraine and Belarus, uh, meaning that your gas supplies are not threatened by military action in Ukraine uh, should Russia decide to be aggressive in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and therefore, it, there are many reasons why it's in the interest economically of many Europeans to turn them a blind eye to what happens in Ukraine. And then there's also the present situation that has been allowed to emerge. The fact that Crimea for seven years now has been occupied by the Russian Federation. Uh, It is now essentially part of Russia, Mm. even though none of the Baltic countries, you know, recognize this, you know, the EU doesn't recognize it. It might not be recognized, but it is accepted. It is by default, de facto accepted that Mm. Crimea has been bitten off and taken by Russia. Mm. Uh, And thus, the, and and the US and Russia continue to have dialogue and continue to trade and all of this sort of stuff. So, with that precedent, yeah, what well, is it really that surprising that Russia might then try and take off the rest of eastern Ukraine and create a direct land mm. connection to Crimea with all the Russian speakers and the Russian Federation and then go across? <laughs> like, well, at least to the Dnieper River. I think I think they would be overstretched if they tried to push beyond Kiev. Mm. Uh, because there would be too much nationalist resistance from Ukraine and then too much support from the EU um, because, you know, then you're really threatening Poland and places like that. Uh, So my hope is that... What is the best outcome? Oh, yeah, you're going to say it. Well, the the best outcome is that Russia is deterred from invading eastern Ukraine. My hope is Mm -hmm. that US, British, uh, Polish, 
Baltic kind of Nordic sort of alliance emerges with like it's a substructure within NATO yeah. to increase military deployments in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, this is risky, of course. It may not work. The Russians may not believe that you know the Brits are really willing to go to the mat on this for eastern Ukraine. Mm. But uh, without a strong show of solidarity, then it is a clear invitation to invade. Right. Uh, because unless you demonstrate a willingness to stand up to, to Russia, uh, then Russia will do exactly as Germany did in the 1930s. They'll just keep pushing until they meet resistance. They yeah. uh, and sometimes that's too late. You know, the, the, the Germans did not really believe the British would declare war on it over Poland. Okay, uh, They were wrong about that. But that... And had they believed that um, England was going to declare war on Germany if they moved into West Poland, they probably wouldn't have done it, to be honest. Um, So these things can be serious mass calculations. And I think it is time for there to be sort of a a pan-solidarity. I don't have confidence in Germany and France. I just don't have confidence. I think that they will be too selfish, uh, too narrow-minded, and unless it affects them directly, won't be interested. So um, what do you mean by interested, won't deploy their own troops? That's right. I mean, yeah. I, like, if put it this way, if Germany said, if you invade eastern Ukraine, we'll be there to fight you, and by the way, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline will be shut down, Vladimir Putin's not going to invade eastern Ukraine. It's not going to be worth his while. Mm. Uh, so far, the only pushback I've seen that was perhaps unexpected from a Russian point of view has been from the Nordic countries, so Sweden and Finland. Mm. Uh, they have said that, look, if you invade eastern Ukraine, the next day we're going to apply for NATO membership, right? Oh, wow. Uh, now, that may like, that would have been a surprise to Vladimir Putin, and I'll talk about this in, in a video. Uh, that might be a surprise t- to the Russian government, but then they may take the view that these countries are de facto NATO members already. After NATO um, moved eastward Mm. from Germany to Estonia, well, strategically, those Nordic countries became so important for NATO that any military contingency that Russia has with NATO is going to involve the Nordic countries anyway. So the Russians may take the view that... Yes, it would be unfortunate for Sweden and Finland to join NATO, yeah. but they're basically NATO members anyway. Mm. Should that stop us from you know, moving into Ukraine? Maybe not. Okay. Um, also, just Russia's attempt to dictate the terms, I think, is just too rich. And if they were, if the Russian government was dealing with a like a serious American leadership, they're not. But if they were. Uh, then they probably wouldn't be so brazen. They're sort of saying, look, if you put military forces into Ukraine, if you might put weapon systems in there, well, that's a red line for us and we're going to invade. Mm. So they're basically trying to dictate what Ukraine can and can't do mm. vis-a-vis the rest of Europe, vis-a-vis the United States. Now, Do you think that, like, is the timing any significant, like, significant at all? Like, is it because they feel that there are fractures within um, NATO and America, um, the US, that it's, it's the time, now is the time that they're deploying military troops on the border. Like, they could have done it earlier. I mean, COVID, obviously, but, you know. Well, yes, and this is a great question. Uh, some people are saying it's all linked to Belarus and the border uh, with the, the EU and, and the migrant crisis. I don't mm. think that's the case. Okay. I think this would be happening irrespective of that situation. I think this, this is something alongside it. Uh, on the one hand, there is a sense that Russia needs to shore up its uh, kind of credentials vis-a-vis China mm-hmm. because China is on the cusp of a military expansion. Okay, China, in the next 5, 10 years, will try and take over Taiwan, will push into the Philippines, will take on the United States directly. Meanwhile, Russia has this unfinished business. You know, it, it seized Crimea... Mm-hmm. It hasn't really closed the deal. The rest of Europe has only affected, you know, accepted in a de facto sense. Mm. Uh, there's all this contested territory in eastern Ukraine. If 
Russia is going to be a credible partner for China in the decades ahead, mm. it needs to show that it can stand up to the West on its own terms. Mm. Uh, and therefore, this would be a good demonstration for China uh, how to, to, to do that. Uh, so there, there is that element. It's, it's got its it political, um, let's say, pride and status mm-hmm. vis-a-vis a much larger ally that it is trying to impress. Uh, the, there's also kind of a historical parallel here. So you've got the Beijing Olympics mm-hmm. that are coming up. Well, the last Beijing Olympics in 2008, right in the middle of the opening ceremony, the war in Georgia began. So Saakashvili did something rather silly and Russia retaliated militarily. And so you had a Russia war with Georgia. Well, this could be a a nice little parallel to have the next Beijing Olympics be the next Russian war. Uh, I haven't seen this reported anywhere. This is just me kind of spitballing. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, But it would be... be yeah, interesting. You know, Putin shows up to the opening ceremony and be like, "Oh, we did it again, guys." Uh, <laughs> so it would be funny, in a in a you know terrible kind of way. yeah, terrible uh, way. Yeah. And I, also, just uh, Vladimir Putin's own popularity uh, is, is under threat. I mean, he, he has been popular. There. He is popular, but he's been there for a long time, and time to find a successor. Yes, but who and. True. Uh, from Putin's point of view, he's going to want a successor who doesn't go after him after he's out of office. Uh, and so this is kind of a, a way to kind of create a legacy. You know, I, I Vladimir Putin, uh, inherited a Russia that was weak on its knees um, from the Yeltsin years, mm. and I have restored its borders to at least a respectable Slavic kind of status where most Russian speakers are under the reign of Moscow. Um, So just a a sheer period of time. And then also an awareness, and this is probably the biggest thing, that the United States can't be everywhere at all times. Yeah. Uh, With the rise of China, the United States must focus on China, Taiwan, that contingency. And therefore, there is a unique period of vulnerability when it comes to Ukraine, which is outside of NATO, You've got reluctant Western European countries who don't want to get involved and the United States who has to focus on Asia. There's nothing China would like more than for the United States to get bogged down in another conflict, Mm. this time in Europe, um, away from Asia. And so the, the Americans know that they have to constrain their military involvement in Europe uh, the Russians know this, mm. and therefore they're seeking to exploit it. So that, from a timing point of view, is relevant. Yeah. So this week you did a video about Nadia Morad uh, right. on the Belarusian border crisis. Mm-hmm. And we have a comment here by uh, Arturs Bondars. Yeah. And they say, I understand the dilemma, but how would border security forces know who y- Yazid <laughs> Yazidi. 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 And who was not? Secondly, as this situation is artificially created, hybrid attack, and those people on the border are par- partly taking part in legal activities, how should we respond? Oh, okay. Policy question. Mm. Right, well, thanks for that, Artis. Uh, so, yeah, to frame it for people that aren't familiar, Nadia Murad is a Nobel laureate who uh, got cancelled in Canada recently from speaking because she wrote a book about her time as a ISIS slave uh, and her emancipation from that brutal dictatorship. Mm. Uh, and they thought that that might be Islamophobic. Too so offensive. she was uh, cancelled, even though she won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but she was in uh, Vilnius recently and said, look, you know, there are hundreds of Yazidis who are stuck along the border and I'd really like for you to let them in. Yeah. And as Artur points out, if you say yes then every single person on that border is going to claim to be Yazidi and everybody who comes into Belarus thereafter will say, I'm a Yazidi, Yazidi. please give me asylum. Now, that is an injustice, not just for the people that are falsely claiming to be Yazidis, but what about other people that come along and who claim to be Yazidis? You let some in but not others. Mm. Uh, That becomes unfair as well. So you can't do that. Uh, the, The policy solution is to maintain the strict control that currently exists on the border, but 
go-to camps in the Middle East, like where Nadia Murad came from. She was imported uh, to Europe from where she lives in Germany now uh, from a camp in northern Iraq. Mm -hmm. You go to the local UNHCR uh, services and say, who has been processed as a refugee? Who can you do background checks on that we know who they are? Mm -hmm. And we can bring in entire families. We can bring in the women, the children. Uh, we're not just bringing in men of fighting age who have self-selected across 15 different countries. We're actually bringing in Yazidis from places where they're experiencing persecution and have escaped their first safe haven. Mm -hmm. That's the best incentive. If you're a genuine refugee, yeah. you want to be able to know that you can go to the nearest kind of UN camp and mm -hmm. that you will be processed and have an opportunity to have your, your claim heard mm -hmm. uh, rather than be competing with people that because they've got money to pay people smugglers, because yeah. they have contacts, they can get to these final destinations uh, themselves, right? Yeah. So you need to be strict on that. Also, we have to remember in the case of this border crisis, most people have been flown in from Turkey. So mm -hmm. they haven't necessarily been Yazidis who... Uh, were in the Middle East who somehow went straight to Minsk. They'd been in Turkey for a while already. Now, in last year's European migration crisis, mm. President Erdogan of Turkey threatened to flood Europe with mm. migrants, 3.6 million of them. This was back when Greece was being flooded. And Erdogan used them as a bargaining chip. says, look, uh, if you don't want that to happen, well, you have to pay me off so I can provide the services here in Turkey. But I'm not going to keep them here unless you give us all this money. So the European Union caved and said, we'll give you 6 billion euros to mm -hmm. house these people in Turkey so you don't, they don't flood the EU. But obviously and, that wasn't enough and now they've moved on to Belarus. Well, Erdogan's had his cake and eaten it too. He's taken the 6 billion euros and then sent these people to Belarus. Right, so he's it, probably it, a bit like Lukashenko here. I've got a, I've got a, a proposal yeah, for you. It exactly. Works. Yeah, get 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 the Europeans to pay you for the same people. So oh. there is no uh, good solution except uh, to deny this being successful. Like the, if the Belarusian government is convinced that mm -hmm. they are unable to get these people across the border and that they're just swelling the ranks of. Uh, Belarus's own border, mm -hmm. then eventually the Belarusian government will admit defeat and give up. Mm. Uh, to that end, uh, over the last few days and weeks, there has been a bit of a stabilisation. Some people from the border have gone back to their home countries. I think that that is regrettable in terms of the reasons why. You know, the weather has turned really bad up there. It's very cold now, mm. much colder than what any of these people would be ever used to. Uh, and so, you know, it's human misery that's pushing them back. But they, it, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. And yeah. uh, this is the fault squarely of Lukashenko. He is responsible for their well-being. I, I am glad that t to a reasonable degree, the European Union has shown solidarity with uh, Poland, Lithuania and Latvia. So things like pushing people back across the border, well, yes, that is technically against some of EU's laws, mm. but this is, a, as Artur says, a manufactured crisis, a mm. actual deliberate attack, and therefore it's exploiting these loopholes yeah. um, rather than you know people just seeking asylum in the normal way. So uh, I think that this is entirely appropriate. You need to be strict on the borders, push people back uh, whenever they try and cross the border, uh, mm -hmm. but show that you are still a humanitarian country that believes in human rights and uh, and you know, rescuing people from terrible um, oppression and, and uh, you know, threats to their life uh, by going to places where they have genuine refugees and collecting them there. Right. Um, so that's yeah. the, the only solution. There is no other way. I mean, Australia has done this as well. It's extraordinarily strict, some would say savage, when it comes to people trying to enter our country by boat. Mm. And yet we still have a very high refugee intake. We go to these various camps around the world. Uh, we just happen to control who comes into the country and the circumstances in which they come. Yeah, and I think that is the best way to do it. Otherwise, you are basically promoting unintended consequences, like, you know, paying out a country while well, they're just going to ship to another country, which also wants to be paid out and then... Who knows? It just get the people get ping ponged. Like you know, is that humanitarian? I don't know. Um, and you're promoting human trafficking, and there's and then yeah, like if you accept these people, there's actual genuine refugees that are missing out. Um, the way the reason how these people and I think there was a comment actually in the video saying you know how I think I pointed it out of like 
they probably paid a lot of money to be there or had genuine connections. Like these people are probably not as um, disadvantaged as others who could, couldn't even make to the border. Yeah. <laughs> right? Of course. So they were self-selected. Um, <sighs> but it does expose one of the weak underbellies of the European Union. It's like, why... If you just think about this broadest, lowest resolution way, mm. why should the European Union accept migrants at all? Okay. Mm. It presupposes that the European Union has a superstructure and a border. Now, what you have is a border of EU member states. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you cross into this one of the Shenzhen area, you are within mm. a uh, internal borderless kind of community. And so if you don't believe that the European Union is somehow the U new United States of Europe, that, that it is actually a nation state in its own right, if you see it as just a collection of other nation states that are working to cooperate, mm. then flooding the EU with migrants is a great way to undermine EU cohesion mm. because the nation states say, there's this superstructure called the European Union that is telling me that I can't control my own borders from people that are a long, long way away and have no right to be here. Mm -hmm. Why would it be part of the European Union? It was a huge factor in why the United Kingdom voted Left. to leave the yeah. EU uh, and it's going to be true for others. Now, there, there are EU crises within the EU, usually monetary crises. So you'll have a massive debt crisis in Greece or <laughs> and you're trying to have the, the Germans bail them out and that creates mm -hmm. internal tension. But then there's external tension and the, the easiest, lowest cost, lowest risk way of destabilising the European Union mm -hmm. is by sending people into it. Does the EU even have a role anymore? Wow. I mean, like, this is a great thing. Like, well, because think about it. Ukraine. Sorry. No, look, look, Ukraine, the French, the Germans, they're basically freeloading, freeloading uh, and taking Russia's side, more yeah. or less. Uh, the EU systems, the structures involved, are Germanic Franco controlled. Okay, because mm. the way the EU Parliament works is it's all based on population. Okay. It's why Turkey was never allowed in, because it has over 80 million people. So it's all based on population. You've got Germany with 80-something million. You've got France with 50-something million. The UK isn't there anymore. So this is basically a German okay. Franco-controlled body. Okay. Mm. When it's in their national interest to ignore the threats to the European Union, mm. then they do. Okay. Such as Ukraine. But if uh, the they it's not in their interest. Mm. Uh, then they they're first ones to to kind of control the other member states as much as possible. That's one of the reasons why uh, the European Commission took Poland to court um, over its judiciary issues. Mm. Uh, it tries to control member states in all kinds of ways. Uh, that's why you know you've got these bodies investigating um, you know, things in Latvia over its domestic politics and things. Like that. It's it's very pernicious in that why sense. is it by population is it just because that's the proportion of people in the yeah all it's all country. it's all basically you get a certain number of seats by country yeah, um, okay. everyone is elected proportionally so one of the drawbacks it's a bit of lopsided isn't it because then the smaller countries don't really have a say that's true they they get a say in uh they get a veto over like admitting new members and things that affect treaties and, and whatnot. Mm. So uh, they can block expansion and things like that. Uh, there is a rotating presidency. So every year uh, a new country will host the presidency of the European Union and kind mm. of lead it as a, as a body as a whole. But when it comes to legislation and its institutions, yeah, I mean, Germany and France dominate. It is diluted a bit in the sense that um, although the representatives come from those countries, they're mm. not nominated by the government of the day. They have their own elections. Mm. And so you get a variety of political parties uh, you know, going to the EU. So you'll get a number of different political parties from Germany ending up in the European Parliament. Some of those um, parties will be, you know, super pro-EU. Some mm. of them will be Eurosceptic. Uh, same was true for Britain. You had, you know, UKIP, which was a totally anti-EU party, mm. was a significant representative um, 
within the European Parliament. This is where Nigel Farage uh, became a political figure. He was in the EU Parliament constantly trying to get himself kicked out of a job, right? That was his goal. So it was the, get Britain out of the EU entirely and to not be there anymore. Mm. So when he created the Brexit party, when the EU uh, referendum had already happened mm. and when was unable, Britain was still kind of stuck in the EU, he created the Brexit party, brought all these new uh, parliamentarians to, to Europe as Brexit party representatives mm. and was there for a few weeks until such time as Britain finally got out of the EU and they all left. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't think the EU has a future. Uh, I, I think that, that its internal cohesion is is going to continue to fray and that this will be accelerated, this decline, mm. by the actions of people like Lukashenko and, and flooding the EU with, with migrants. Mm. Uh, because countries like Poland and Lithuania and Latvia, they, they still care about their borders. Yeah, of uh, course. And while they see the EU as being... Um, important for their territorial integrity against Russia and important for them economically in terms of trade and and so forth, Um, the disadvantages of that, I think, are also going to become increasingly clear. I mean, if you look at the populations of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, for example, they've all been in serious decline. Why? Because young people have left for higher incomes elsewhere in Europe. Uh, If all of those people were repatriated back to their home countries then those countries would do extremely well with their youth, their intelligence, their education and their investment. Mm. That, that would help bring those countries up. So it, it, that, that could happen if they weren't in the EU. If they went back to their normal currencies that they had pre-EU and floated those currencies, then those currencies would depreciate relative to the euro uh, and it, attract foreign investment, attract uh, tourists, attract people to go there. So I'm not saying that they should do that necessarily. This is a, a long story mm that the challenge for these countries is either to find a a way to make the EU work for them Mm -hmm. or to move away from the EU but maintain a strong sense of security. And and I see that with Britain at the moment. So Liz Truss has recently gone to Estonia and there's an awesome photo of her in a tank riding around Estonia, Liz Truss being the uh, British Foreign Secretary. Uh, And so the Brits are trying to deepen their military relationships with the Baltic, with Poland, um, on their own outside of the EU. Mm. And that might actually tease these countries out as well. If you've got like Poland, Estonia, Latvia saying, hey, we've got a deep relationship with Britain, Britain being the only serious military country in Europe, Mm. then why do we need the EU? We can have our security with with the Anglos, uh, you know. Yeah. With, so it, it, this is all, but this is dangerous for the European Union. I think people should be, uh, if I was in the European Commission, I'd be taking this quite seriously. We've already had the example of Britain leaving the EU. Um, what what are we doing for the people in the Baltic? Mm. Yeah, some food for thought, just thinking if there will be any replacement. But, I mean, if there was no EU, then France... And Germany would have to shore up their military spent because there's no other, yeah, other countries to back them up. Um, on a different topic, mm-hmm. I want to talk about labour shortage. So, as I mentioned earlier in this video, uh, my ceiling fell down. And I won't be able to have a new ceiling until next year because there are no workers. What? Wow. Okay. (laughs) So until after Christmas. Yeah. So they predict maybe February or March. Right. And that is like astounding because I always thought, you know, Australia is kind of like the workers place to be. Like we have lots of people, you know, going around. But I think since the pandemic, you know, and our very tight borders, we're not able to get a lot of immigrant migrants in and mm. kind of have that flow, right? And I'm also finding at other places too, like it's so hard to find covers um, if you're sick and all those kind of things. Have you found that? Have you kind of felt the Well, funny you should say that. Tension? Just, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I received an email from Rio Tinto saying okay. we've got all these job opportunities like just a random email <laughs> fr- from a company that i don't have anything to do with they just got my email address and just spammed uh, you <laughs> and just spammed me it's like you know have you thought about joining our great team 
Uh, and I mean, I didn't click, like I clicked on it and saw the... the was it a genuine email? Like, yeah, yeah, it was oh. from, from Rio. Okay. Uh, which, if you think about the way we're traditionally told, like imagine you're a teenager and what's the thing that people say? I'll go around to different businesses, hand in your resume, see if they've got yeah, any jobs available. Right. Well, that's, that's happening. But, but in reverse, switch. the yeah. massive companies are going to random people being like, hey, would you like a job? And I, I remember this happening in Western Australia during the mining boom. Uh, mm. So there was this period of time when we were still best mates with China and China was just thirsty for iron ore. Uh, what would happen is that people would be trained in government to, say, be a teacher. Mm. They would have to go to some remote community to do some teaching. Yes, yes. They would get off the plane and before they had left the airport, someone would come up to them and be like, so you can go teach these miners kids and they're obviously not going to care about anything you say because they're going to grow up to become miners. Or we can pay you four times as much as what you're being promised to earn and you can drive this truck. <laughs> and, and, and when you weigh so, it up, yes. And so the, like the government was losing staff because they were getting poached as soon as they got out there. Like literally as soon as that they got out there. That makes so much sense. Uh, okay. <laughs> and we now then then, you know, obviously that that waned. Mm. But now that we have had the borders closed for so long, yeah. uh, and you know, commodities and things are still quite expensive, and there's a lot of major investment projects and things underway, mm. there's a great demand for labor, particularly skilled labor. Skill labor, but also like just farming. I'm sorry, but yeah. Australians do not like to farm. So you typically get the backpackers that do it mm. in a promise that they can stay longer and extend their visas and all that kind of stuff. We don't have that. <laughs> we have a very, I think they do fly in um, certain countries in on a regular basis because of the shortage. Cause it's just, you know, if our food, food demands not going any state, um, any lower. Uh, yeah. It made, it went through multiple phases. So initially, because Australia didn't have much disease, there was just straight fear. So mm. people that were already here, backpackers and things like that, they're like, I don't want to go home because my country is being ravaged by the disease and everything's kind of you know chaos and there's all this corruption and blah, blah, blah. Here in Australia, I can be safe. I can. So they would go to remote areas. Mm. Uh, if you go to remote areas in Australia, you will find a lot of foreign tourists who are working in bars and things like that, trying to, to make ends meet. And then there was an expectation that borders would open up. But this has taken way longer than yeah. anyone could have dreamt of. So some people have gone home mm. to their foreign countries because it's been so long. And then all of these major industries that had delayed these kind of projects for as long as they thought they were able to delay uh, are now underway. So they are mm. willing to pay enormous salaries uh, to get... But even, even with these offers... Uh, it's hard to get people to work, yeah. you know, particularly in, in in jobs that are very very difficult. I mean, we're talking you know difficult conditions in very hot climates, in the middle of nowhere under under harsh conditions. Um, mm. You have to be offering money that most people mm. uh, would feel could set them up for life. If you know what I mean, and and it, not many small businesses and things mm. could possibly do that. Yeah, and it does highlight some holes also in our existing system. Say. Um, the health system, right? So there are some, depending on where you're in Australia, but like not all of our cities offer like the whole specialty. Mm. So there's like very highly specialized professions that you need to actually go like to certain states to be fully qualified. You actually can't get your whole degree here. So that means that once they fly over interstate, we lose them because they get poached somewhere else. And then there's a gap to fill. And then that's where we rely on immigrants to come in, like from Scotland, a lot of Scottish people <laughs> are highly qualified to come in and fill those needs, but we don't have that. It's it's like a loose lease <laughs> a bit. That's true. No, it's a very good point. I mean, the the thing that had always made Australia and its economy work was its fast moving capital. Mm. So the ability to have everything floated on the exchange, so its currency. Uh, the, the banking exchange, the financial sector, and the human capital sector, people yeah. flying in and out rapidly to yes. give surge capacity to certain amounts of work. There, This will change expectations because uh, as the economy gradually opens, you'll have new centres of 
constituency. So let's say you've got a group of people that have been working in a field that they've enjoyed a lot of wage growth, they're getting a lot of benefits, mm. and suddenly uh, the government is welcoming in foreign workers. And the tap kind of turns off. Yeah, that could really undermine local wages and create a sort of sense of dislocation. Now, when it's all free moving and free capital and people are kind of used to it, they just mm. go where the work is, then that's kind of accepted. But if it's something that is a, you know, people have gotten into the groove of doing things a certain way mm -hmm. with everything locked down, there might be some resentment as foreign workers and things are brought in. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Um, certainly it has been beneficial for the Australian economy previously mm. to deal with the bottlenecks in the, like, because once you get, you know, the engineers for this diamond mine somewhere, mm -hmm. well, that creates a lot of other jobs because they've suddenly got the production and, yeah. and then get everything's underway. So it, it is useful for others if you get the workers in, but uh, there, there's that initial sense of dislocation. Plus the fact that we don't have the disease and mm. the foreign workers will be bringing that disease in. Um, so people will be freaking out about that. But then there's also yeah, there's the mandates. Of, yeah, and the mandates. But then there's also a bit of a crisis, right? Like with the um, the border restrictions and people, it's difficult for people to fly in and fly out, um, that the dislocation of work. So everyday jobs, bus driving, mm -hmm. being at a restaurant, you know, doing waitressing or whatnot, suddenly we have a, a very high shortage because they're all moving to the mines. <laughs> Or moving to where jobs have opened up and they can be offered four times, five times more um, more money, mm. you know, and then there's a big gap. <laughs> and then what do you do to fill that gap if there's no influx? Uh, yeah, it's just... Yeah, so if you're an engineer, guys, or girls, <laughs> now's the time. Oh, yeah, now's Australia. the time to come here because... Uh, because you get, you get the mega bucks. Um, <laughs> yeah, but... it's crazy. But what you were saying? I was just saying that, that we are about to experience a significant social change. Mm. Australia has been in this bubble just long enough for it to have become a new normal for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never been comfortable with it because I'm a, an intrinsic traffic traveller <laughs> and I need to get and do places. But uh, there, for many people, that is not the case. Many people will be happy to be closed off forever. Some people and haven't even left the state, let's be real. <laughs> like We all know one. Yeah, the people who, and not just like with the disease, like their entire lives. Yeah. Uh, and so they're happy. They want things to be this way. And we will see this being like, I, there'll be a political constituency to support it. Mm. Uh, and I'm finding this already with our internal borders. Mm. So at the state level, um, they have asserted their sovereignty in a way that had never been the case previously that we like everyone was australia first until the pandemic and now everyone is kind of state first which is really weird like people see themselves as um you know victorians or queenslanders or western australians and they perceive people from other states primarily through the lens of threat threat to, from the pandemic threat from uh wages mm. uh, and that is uh very un australian very un australian yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a good way to put it um, but mm. we'll see. Uh, I, I mean, what about you guys? Have you, have you found that uh, the, the lockdowns, the restrictions and movements of people has impacted wages? I mean, I know that there is a significant supply shortage in Europe because people have moved out of freight. So mm. previously there was a lot of uh, truck drivers and things like that. The wages have been increasing so dramatically yeah. that uh, either the companies will no longer pay those wages and that these people move to other industries mm. or uh, they are demanding so much that the actual cost of the freight itself is increasing. Mm. Uh, and that's one of the inflationary pressures that we see with gas prices. And, and yeah, that. and that's what they said. I think I heard it on the news about Amazon. So Amazon typically had a very high turnover in its staff, mm. you know, and especially when the pandemic first Hit, they were obviously booming because yeah. that's people online shopping and they didn't really stop so they recruited a lot of workers in but their whole business model was to like move things quickly and they kind of churned out their workers um because very repetitive tasks you know people don't last very long mm. um but then they realized yeah with the shortage in certain industries they're losing a lot of staff and they can't keep up with the demand it still grows but they don't have people to deliver said goods <laughs> Um, so they take a huge hit in terms of like 
increasing wages and investing in their workers to maintain retention. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think the culture of work will also change as well. I think people are going to expect more. Is that make, that's so weird to say? Like, I think um, the whole concept of working from home wasn't really a thing. Like, it will in you know what I imagined when I graduate university. I didn't think I'd actually have the possibility to work from home. Um, but now it's become a new normal and people are like, yeah, you don't actually have to go in the office. Some people have a smaller office because they don't need it, <laughs> you know, or like people are happy to have short term roles because they realize that there's jobs everywhere now. Um, well, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, my, my last point on this, and maybe I'll do a video on this in the future is that we went, the industrial age was you, you got your qualification, whatever you, your apprenticeship. You went into a company and you stayed there for 50 years and then they would give you a pension or whatever when you retired, right? That was the the model. And then for Gen Y and Gen Z, it was like, okay, you might be in a job for like five years max, but you should be prepared to change careers at least three times in your life, like from one role dramatically to another. Mm. Whereas now we are almost reaching that end point where every person is a business, like they are they've worked out their own labor value and mm-hmm. they and they will flow where the capital demands them to go yeah. and that what has happened with these restrictions is we've created capital bottlenecks where people are unable to utilize their full economic potential they no longer see themselves as part of a company they see themselves as working for themselves who might lend out themselves mm. rent out their labor to various companies mm. and so the role of individual contractors Mm. is dramatically increasing and when you say that people are working from home there is no like one of the things that i don't think has been studied yet is that if you work from home you reduce dramatically the sense of connection to that organization like if you if you're working from home you're not seeing your colleagues you're not wearing the uniform uh you're not answering the phone with the same you know welcome to whatever uh you don't see yourself in that light you see yourself as a person doing work for this entity for this company, yeah. and you could be doing that same thing for a million other companies yeah. so we are reaching a point where we're all kind of remote workers hmm. um but that's for another time that's a that's a deeper topic yeah um, that is a different topic yeah hmm. yeah uh, okay great on that note i think that's all the time we have for today any questions any feedback please leave them down below got questions we're happy to discuss in the next week in review if you haven't already, uh, subscribe. We're on our road to, I don't know, where we're going to head. <laughs> <laughs> Sky's the limit. Yeah. Also, uh, just um, one other thing. The book club, uh, you'll have seen The Witcher book club before this comes out. I hope mm-hmm. you've really enjoyed it. Please do leave your book club recommendations uh, in the description, either here or on that video. Yeah. Uh, because we are picking up the rest for coming 12 months yep. uh, and we're looking forward to it. We really enjoy it. So uh, yep. hopefully you, you will as well. Okay. All right. Stay safe and ciao for now. <laughs>